OK, let's start the general discussion. Question one. Why do you agree that the trouble is he is without imagination? So nobody took this question today, so it's my question. Uh, where is it? OK, so. From the. Previous page, page 38. But all this, the mysterious far reaching hairline trail, the absence of sun from the sky, the tremendous cold and the strangeness and weirdness of it all made no impression on the man. It was not because he was long used to it. He was a newcomer in the land, a Chichakwo, and this was his first winter. The trouble with him was that he was without imagination. He was quick and alert in the things of life, but only in the things and not in the significances. So it's saying maybe the man can grasp key information. Maybe he can describe to you what it what the situation is, but he sometimes doesn't realize that. The situation is therefore serious. He knows what, but he doesn't know what it, it means. So it's like if I describe to you. In this class, the grading policy is 40% midterm, 40% final and 20% attendance. But and you understand what I'm saying, but you don't realize this means that you should come to class to get those 20 points. Right, so you know what I'm saying, but you don't understand why it's important. Uh, and so this does seem to be the man's problem, right? Later on in the next paragraph. He spits and the spit freezes in the air before it hits the ground. It says he knew that at 50 degrees below zero, spittle crackled on the ground, but this spittle had crackled in the air. Undoubtedly, it was colder than 50 below. How much colder he did not know. And at this point, somebody with imagination might think it is colder than 50 below. I planned on it being 50 below, but it's even colder than that. Am I prepared? Will I make it? Should I turn back? But no, the next sentence says, but the temperature did not matter. He was bound for the old claim on the left fork of Henderson Creek where the boys were already. So he realizes it's colder than he thought, and his next thought is, oh, I'd better hurry to my destination. So it does seem like he's lacking imagination in that sense. Why might imagination be important here? Well, as we just saw, this is his first winter on the Yukon in Alaska. It is famously one of the coldest places humans can live. It, and he's far away from the town where he started. He's in the middle of nature. In the freezing, freezing cold back in the days before cell phones, before GPS. I think usually somebody would have to be very careful and have uh, emergency plans for that situation. Uh, so when things go wrong, you have to be able to adapt or you have to think of a way to save yourself, and that requires imagination. So if the man does not have. That kind of imagination, then when shit starts happening, he would very easily die, which is, of course, what happens in the story. Now, that's not to say that you only need uh, imagination when you're in Alaska. I think it's very important to have this kind of imagination in daily life as well. Like every day we wake up, we go to school, we go to work, we think about what the day might be like, and then something unexpected happens. 
uh, that you didn't plan for and it causes some annoyance or even trouble. And you have to be able to adjust. You can't just say, I refuse to accept this and then the problem will go away. It's not going to go away. So even if it's just daily life, I think it's important to have this kind of imagination. Question two, why is the dog in this story? This is actually a, a very popular question today. Everybody likes dogs. If you don't like dogs, you're a monster. So what is its purpose in the story? Um, a lot of you noticed that the dog mainly is there to express that the situation is dangerous. So this is connected with question three, the dog's instinct. Uh, it seems like every time we see the dog, it's kind of like afraid of this or it, it's, its instinct tells it to avoid that danger, which is something that the man usually does not do. Right? The dog thinks it's too cold, we shouldn't go, the man keeps going. The dog thinks this, is, this frozen river is dangerous, we shouldn't walk on it. The man pushes the dog in front of him uh, as a kind of warning sign. Uh, we can look at that one actually. Page 40. Forty-one. Um, okay, so in the middle of the first paragraph, the man, there it turns out they're walking on a creek. A creek is like a stream, xilio, a frozen creek. The man knew that the coldest snaps, which means when the weather, the temperature drops very fast, that the coldest snaps never froze these springs, and he knew likewise their danger. They were traps. They hid pools of water under the snow that might be three inches deep or three feet. Sometimes a skin of ice half an inch thick covered them and in turn was covered by the snow. Sometimes there were alternate layers of water and ice skin so that when one broke through, he kept on breaking through for a while, sometimes wetting himself to the waist. So like the ice can be very thin, it could be very thick. They don't know, and that's the problem. That was why he had shied in such panic. He had felt the give under his feet and heard the crackle of snow hidden ice skin. So he knows this is dangerous. Uh, next paragraph, line three. Once again, however, he had a close call and once Suspecting danger, he compelled the dog to go on in front. The dog did not want to go. It hung back until the man shoved it forward, and then it went quickly across the white, unbroken surface. So we see here that the dog knows it's dangerous also. He doesn't know about the structure of the ice and the water and the snow. He doesn't know about the different situations, but the dog's instinct tells it that this is dangerous. And so in this situation, the dog doesn't want to do it, and the man forces the dog to go. So one function of the dog in the plot is to serve as the man's early warning sign. But we also have the dog as a kind of representative of nature. His instinct is a natural instinct. So if he feels like it's dangerous, it's actually nature telling us and telling the man that it's dangerous. Even if the man thinks he can be careful, even if he thinks he can make it, the dog is telling us, nature is telling you, this is dangerous, you shouldn't do it. Um, another reason I heard was that the dog is kind of representing the man's conscience in a way. So like, uh, when the dog is warning the man, it's also like the dog is the man's subconscious. Like he knows it's dangerous. He knows he probably shouldn't go. So when he decides to keep going, some part of his mind is warning him this is a bad idea. And the story could be giving that role to the dog as well. 
So the dog is representative of nature and also of the man's subconscious, which makes sense because the subconscious is like the natural part of our brain. When we think one way, but the situation is another way, that's when our subconscious tells us. And then finally, one last thought about this question is that the dog is a dog. It's a cute, big husky. Uh, and uh, dogs often served as work animals, as companions. In this case, they don't. The dog and the man don't really have like a close relationship. The man here is using the dog as a warning signal, and the dog later uh, wants the man to make fire because the dog knows what fire is, and he knows that fire is warm. Uh, let's see if I can find it. Uh, not yet. But the dog basically is following the man because he knows that the man is able to create fire, is able to, to give it food. Uh, and so it sticks with the man in order to live. And we get the opposite of this at the end of the story when the man freezes to death. And at the very end, the dog turned and trotted up the trail in the direction of the camp it knew, where were the other food providers and fire providers. So the dog isn't looking for a new companion. It's looking for a new source of food and fire. So the man and the dog are companions in the sense that they're working together to try to survive this snowstorm. This like cold snap. Um, and so it's not like a typical man dog relationship that we usually have today. It's not like owner and pet. It's more like two teammates working together. Uh, and so when we see the man keep making mistakes and we see the dog keep uh, thinking that this is dangerous, this is wrong, we tend to agree with the dog. The story gives us enough information to realize it's dangerous. And so we tend to agree with the dog. The dog is there so that we have a character we can relate to. We have somebody we can agree with. We're not just uh, thinking, oh, what a stupid man. We're thinking, what a poor dog who is uh, abandoned by his teammate, basically. Ignored by his teammate. OK, question. <laughs> Very strange. Question three, uh, the dog's instinct. Yes, so related to the previous question, here the dog's instinct is telling us that it is representing nature. Let's look at the three examples. Page 39. Okay, so this is where we first meet the dog. At the man's heels trotted a dog, a big native husky, the proper wolf dog gray coated and without any visible or temperamental difference from its brother, the wild wolf. So basically it looks like a wolf. It thinks like a wolf. The animal was depressed by the tremendous cold. It knew that it was no time for traveling. Its instinct told it a truer tale than was told to the man by the man's judgment. So this is again a very direct comparison. The man, as a typical human being, gathers information and makes a judgment about that information. Very logical, as one group mentioned. But the dog goes by instinct. The dog doesn't care about the number of the temperature, what, how many degrees it is. It just knows that it's too cold. And that's the most important information. It's a truer tale than the man's thinking. Uh, and the story agrees with the dog, right? It says, in reality, it was not merely colder than 50 below zero. It was colder than 60 below, than 70 below. 
it was 75 below zero. So this is saying, even though the dog doesn't know the number, the author tells you the number to show you that the dog is right. It's too cold. Uh, the word instinct appears again on the next page. Ah, here's where we see the dog who wants fire. The So from line three, okay, let's start from the beginning, line one. The man did not know anything about thermometers, Wen Du Ji. Possibly in its brain, there was no sharp consciousness of a condition of very cold, such as was in the man's brain. So maybe the dog itself had never experienced a very cold situation. but. The brute had its instinct. It experienced a vague but menacing apprehension that subdued it and made it slink along at the man's heels. So the dog has a natural anxiety, not based on anything it knows. It's just natural. And this anxiety makes it follow the man. And that made it question eagerly every unwanted movement of the man. Unwanted is spelled correctly. Want means tendency. Unwanted means unexplained or without reason. So every time the man makes a movement that has no real purpose, the dog is kind of looking at it and it expects eagerly questioning, right? So it's, it's looking at the man and expecting him to do something such as, um, as if expecting him to go into camp or to seek shelter somewhere and build a fire. The dog had learned fire and it wanted fire or else to burrow under the snow and cuddle its warmth away from the air. So the dog is not following the man because he loves him. He's following the man because the man can make fire. Um, if you are ever stuck in the very cold weather, one way to save yourself is, as the dog says, burrow under the snow and like huddle yourself together. The snow is frozen water, but if it doesn't take heat away from you, it actually prevents you from losing heat. It's a very good insulation material. It had a go and shall go and hop. So if you're not like touching the snow, right? If you're dressed in a jacket and coat, uh, it can help you preserve your temperature. Uh, okay, and the third mention of instinct is on page 41. I think we already saw this. Uh, we haven't seen this yet. Um, we almost saw it. Right, so this is where he pushes the dog to go in front in case the ice breaks. The dog did not want to go. It hung back until the man shoved it forward, and then it went quickly across the white, unbroken surface. Suddenly, it broke through, floundered to one side, and got away to firmer footing. So yes, it tried to cross quickly, but he wanted, like his the dog's foot breaks through the ice. He kind of struggles a bit, and then he stands uh, on the other side. It had wet its forefeet and legs, so its two front feet got wet. And Im almost immediately, the water that clung to it turned to ice. It made quick efforts to lick the ice off its legs, then dropped down in the snow and began to bite out the ice that had formed between the toes. This was a matter of instinct. To permit the ice to remain would mean sore feet. It did not know this. It merely obeyed the mysterious prompting that arose from the deep crypts of its being, which means something deep inside him urged him to quickly get rid of the ice. He doesn't know why, but he follows that feeling, that instinct. Now, then we get the man, but the man knew having achieved a judgment on the subject, and he removed the mitten from his right hand and helped tear out the ice particles. So we see here an example of dog and man working together.
but they do the same thing for different reasons. The dog, because something deep inside him tells him you have to get rid of the ice. The man, because he has thought about it and he realized that if the dog's feet are frozen, then it can't walk very well and it will slow him down. Therefore, we must get rid of the ice. Two different ways of understanding the situation. And as you can tell from the way I explained it, the human way would seem to be much slower. Right? He has to think about it. He has to come to a conclusion and then he starts to act too slow. Yeah, so the story keeps on emphasizing the dog's instinct to show that he is connected to nature and that the man, even when he reaches the same conclusion, does it in a way that is much slower and less efficient. Uh, and sometimes the man does not even reach the same conclusion at all. And whenever he reaches a different conclusion, he's wrong. Question four, one must not be too sure of things, and yet the man continues. Why? One group took this question. So like this is after a whole series of events, right? The dog feet are frozen. The man takes off his mitten to help get rid of the ice. Then the man's hand starts to freeze. So he does like puts on the mitten. He tries to get it to warm up again, and then he tries to do something else, and he realizes, wow, it's really cold. Uh, so let's see, where is it? Here. Okay, second paragraph. The man pulled the mitten on hurriedly and stood up. He was a bit frightened. He stamped up and down, like so he's stomping his feet until the stinging returned into the feet. So his feet were so cold that he lost feeling in them. He has to get the feeling back. It certainly was cold, was his thought. That man from Sulphur Creek had spoken the truth when telling how cold it sometimes got in the country. And he had laughed at him at the time. That showed one must not be too sure of things. There was no mistake about it. It was cold. He strode up and down, stamping his feet and threshing his arms. So he's also hitting his arms. Until reassured by the returning warmth, then he got out matches and proceeded to make a fire. So let's think about this. He starts to lose feeling in his arms and legs, and that tells him it's much colder than he thought, and that tells him the guy who told him it's very cold, don't go, that guy was right. But then instead of doing anything else, he starts making a fire, which, yeah, you know, you're, you, that's a good idea. Making a fire is a good idea. But he doesn't think, maybe I shouldn't have come. Maybe I should turn back. Maybe I should change my plans. Nothing. He keeps going uh, in the direction of his original plan. Why? Well, one key might be here. Reassured. So, yes, it's colder than he thought. And at first it scares him, but when he is able to get feeling back into his arms and legs, he feels reassured. And so it's it to him, it's kind of like the feeling of danger has passed. The need to do something about it has passed. So he doesn't feel that urgency anymore. And so he doesn't feel the need to reconsider his plans. For this kind of guy, it probably will take until he has no other choice left before he will finally start thinking, maybe I was wrong. Um, but there's another possible reason. Look at the way he thinks about this. One must not be too sure of things. He doesn't say, I was too confident. I need to rethink this. He says, one. One means a person. So it's possible he, he's thinking, you know, uh, how the old saying goes, one must not be too sure of things. Ha ha ha. And then he keeps going, right? Like 
he thinks about how this is a common saying and he thinks, oh, I guess the saying does make sense, but he doesn't apply that saying to himself. It's like saying it's like uh, if today you walk into class and you didn't read the story and you have no idea what I'm talking about. And I say, see, that's why you should always do the reading before class. And you might think, yeah, the teacher's right. I should do the reading so I can understand. But then the next week you still don't do the reading. All right, so you know the idea, but you don't apply it to yourself. Um, that could be another reason why the man doesn't reconsider his plan. He thinks, oh, the cliche makes sense, but he doesn't realize the significance, the importance of this idea. And of course, another group said he's basically just a very stubborn man. Which is true. And finally, why do you think the author uses this kind of language? One group took this question. Of course, when it's when I call it like simple, often short sentences, some sentences are longer, not many. And some words are harder, but not most of them. Like compared to last week's story, this story should be much easier to read. So why does he do that? Why does the author do this? Last week I mentioned one reason is because he's writing for a popular audience. Uh, so his readers may not have gone to college. His readers may not have even graduated high school. Uh, so he needs to write in language that more people can easily understand, you know, in order to make money. Um, but the group that took this question today talked about ideas related to this specific story. For example, it's a dangerous situation that the protagonist finds himself in. And so perhaps these uh, shorter sentences, these simpler words, are to help us understand how dangerous the situation is. When you're in danger, you usually don't use fancy language, right? You use straightforward, direct language. So the fact that the situation is being described using simple, straightforward language helps to convey the idea that it's dangerous. There's no time for thinking too much. You have to take the right action. And this is connected with the shorter sentences. Uh, when we read, usually our brain only stops and thinks about what we read when we reach the end of a sentence. This is why long sentences are harder to understand, even if the sentence structure is not too hard. Our brain only thinks about it when we reach the end. So by giving us a series of shorter sentences instead of one long sentence it's giving our brain uh it's letting our brain catch up faster we are reacting faster to this information it feels like we are going faster shorter sentences speed up the experience of reading and that also adds to the danger, it adds to the tension, it adds to the excitement. Things are happening fast, it feels like. And so when the man is in danger, he also has to react fast. He also has to find a way out of danger very quickly. And the shorter sentences help us feel that as well. And then finally, this group also mentioned that maybe it has to do with the man himself. As we just said earlier, the man lacks a certain kind of imagination. He doesn't think too deeply about his situation. He gathers information, he understands the information, and that's it. So it's kind of like how the story is also emphasizing information, right? The temperature the weather, the behavior of the dog. And if the man does think something, he's usually thinking, wow, it is cold, and that's it. So it's kind of like 
the simpler sentences, the simpler language is also reflecting the way that the protagonist thinks or doesn't think about his situation. If you remember last week, last week's story was basically all memory. And so you had the long sentences, you had each character is thinking about the other character. Um, but here, it, the story is mostly action. And so the sentences are shorter. The language is, is a bit easier to understand. OK, do you have questions about today's discussion? OK, so next week, we're going to read five poems. Now, the poems are going to get a bit harder. Because um, we're starting to move into the early 20th century. And with the early 20th century comes modernism. Modernism is a style of literature that actively works to make you not understand. The authors, the modernist authors often think that their job is to preserve and make use of traditional culture and that only a reader who understands this culture should be able to enjoy their work. They're, they, they see themselves as kind of defenders and they are defending culture and literature against people who do not have enough education to deserve to enjoy it. And that poses a problem for us because most of us are from a different cultural background. Uh, we don't use English as our native language, most of us. So the, the things that they are trying to express could be even harder for us to understand. Now, next week will not be that hard, but week nine will be very terrible. Week nine, uh, last year when I was teaching the poems in week nine, I basically gave up on the discussion. I just gave a lecture because nobody knew what, what the hell was going on. Um, but week eight, there's still some hope. Uh, the poems themselves, if you remember uh, Emily Dickinson, the numbered poems, the language is not too hard. It, but the hard part is figuring out what is going on. It's kind of similar for uh, next week's poems. We're going to read two. What are we going to read? Uh, Wallace Stevens. Two poems, right? We're going to read two poems of Wallace Stevens and. Uh, three. Poems by William Carlos Williams. And they're not like. Hard to read. But they're also not easy to understand. OK, so let me introduce these two authors. Wallace Stevens. And William Carlos Williams. Are poets who care about imagery. Of course, every poet cares about Im or I should say most poets care about imagery, but for these two, they use imagery as part of their argument. So sometimes when a poet writes a poem, they want to convey some kind of information or they want to give you some kind of experience. They want to tell you something about the world. Uh, and so traditionally, this kind of poetry can feel like an essay, except it's written like a poem. But for these two, the the meaning is in the imagery. The imagery itself carries the meaning, and they believe that this is the best way to use poetry because otherwise they would just write an essay. Right? It's like how something uh, some filmmakers will say that this film cannot be described in words. That's why I'm making a movie for these two poets. Their ideas cannot be explained in an essay. It has to be conveyed through poetry, and that's why they're writing poems. If I remember correctly, 
Wallace Stevens is a doctor and William Carlos Williams is an insurance of executive. I might have that backwards. Actually, let me check. This is very important. Uh, I keep getting them confused because they're both white collar workers. It doesn't say what the hell. Uh, OK, yes, OK, so Wallace Stevens is the insurance guy and William Carlos Williams is the doctor. Sorry, OK, so uh, the joke is that Wallace Stevens is the world's most important insurance executive. Uh, because he is a world class poet in his free time. He really hated his job. Like he did not. His job at the insurance company was to figure out the correct level of insurance payments so that the company would not lose money. So he basically had to like figure out how much is this injury worth? How much should we pay if this guy dies? That kind of thing. Uh, it's very soul killing work. It's reducing people to money. And so in his free time, he wrote poetry. And it, he wrote very important poetry. William Carlos Williams had a, a bit better in life. He was a, a physician. He's a, a family doctor. In the early 20th century in the United States, you didn't go to the doctor. The doctor came to you. So like if you somebody in your family was sick, you would call the doctor and the doctor would grab his doctor's bag and he would come over to see you. And if the situation was really serious, then he would suggest you go to the hospital. So uh, WCW, William Carlos Williams, was this kind of doctor, a family doctor. And he was very good at it. P his patients loved him. He had a very good relationship uh, with the people in his community. And you can feel the difference. Like both poets care about imagery, but Wallace Stevens's poems are a bit more cerebral, a bit more intellectual. You have to think about it a bit more. But WCW's poems are more uh, gentle, more, I guess in Chinese we call this like it feels like it's more ordinary, more like from everyday life, but he manages to add uh, another layer of meaning on top of what looks like something that can be quite simple and quite ordinary. So it kind of reflects their careers, right? Wallace Stevens is thinking about numbers all day. WCW is talking with patients and interacting with patients all day. Right, so next week, uh, before next week, please read these five poems. Um, 13 Ways of Looking at a Blackbird. And the, uh, or not the, and Anecdote of the Jar by Wallace Stevens. And then The Red Wheelbarrow, This Is Just to Say, and Landscape with the Fall of Icarus by WCW. You can ignore the first half of page 53. I just didn't feel like working too hard to cut that part out. But um, this is just to say ends on the same page. Right? The If you see the date in the bottom right, that is the ending. It tells you that the text has ended. Okay, question, and then next week I will ha give you the handout for the final exam. And I will explain the midterm exam in more detail. Questions? Okay, have fun. See you next week.